get this started here. Okay, good. Yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, this time, if you have, we're going to discuss hermeneutics as practical philosophy, a classic essay by Gadamer. We've done some obscure ones and some overview ones, some technical ones, and now we're going to one of the classics, one of the ones that are often used in in classes. Nancy, did you say that you use this in your class? Yeah, okay. So yeah. we can talk about yeah. what it's like to teach it as well and how students respond to it. Um, one thing, uh, Abdul's back. One thing I, I thought we might try to do this time in order to get more people involved, I sent out, and I, I threw together an outline. It's in the chat, in case that's helpful to give you sort of a sense of the structure, the main ideas. It can become a reference point for us if we decide if everyone has it. Um, and it's something we can talk about too, whether I set that up correctly or not. Um, one thing I'd like to do is is to try to uh, stick, try to stick on a question longer. So what happens is, this happens to me, someone will make some great question, bring up something I've never thought of before. I thought, wow, I've never thought about that. And some people are quicker and they come in and they move, and it's moved on before I even have a chance to think about what I want to say. And sometimes that's a relief. Like, okay, now I don't have to think about it anymore. We've moved on. And, uh, but sometimes I feel like there must be other people too who are in the same way where they just starting to get ideas and getting, getting their head wrapped around it. And now we've moved on to something else. So if we could be explicit about what we're working on in the moment and uh, use that and keep it on the table for longer, it'll give a chance for more people, I think, to reflect on it and get in. Um, Let's see, is there anything else that I was gonna... Um, the other thing is that we could do is we could use the chat. So if somebody has something they really wanna talk about, it's on their mind and we're doing something else, they could put it in, they could load it into the chat. Say, I really wanna talk about this. And then it becomes within sort of marked and it's there and we can return to it. And the chat becomes a place where we can raise questions separately as well, rather than interrupting what's going on. Or if you'd rather just put it there rather than, rather than talk into the video that would work as well okay does that make sense so this is why i think this is what i've been starting all the discussions with is a question like this what do we need to talk about what would you if we didn't talk about this today you'd be so disappointed you would never return again <laughs> i think, can't believe i just spent two hours and they didn't once bring up something so the idea is to get some oh John Arthos has put something in the chat already. <laughs> John, <laughs> it's fair to like say that, but okay, we have the a yeah. big one. The relationship between theory and practice. John, are you there? You want to say more about that? Uh yeah, sure. So this has always been the big question for me with this essay because it's um it announces so clearly. It's the only place that I'm aware of that he says with sort of crystal clarity, both both at the beginning and the end of the essay that hermeneutics is not the practice, it's the theory of the practice. But, um, but um, you know, in that wonderful way that he, that sort of his characteristic sort of uh, productive ambiguity, he immediately starts to confuse that claim, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of in the middle of the essay, he's doing the opposite, right? So, so for, well, so let me just, can I, can I sort of cite the text at this point? Yeah, um, please do. Okay, so at the beginning and on the first page, and I'm using the Reason the Age of Science translation, is that the one that people are using? I'm okay. using uh, Gadamer Reader. Oh, okay. But we'll figure it I'll, out. Okay, so. Okay. Um, I'm, yeah, it's I'm, the same translation, but uh, just uh, the pagination is not, is different. Okay. True. So on the first page, anyway, I imagine for both, um, he he uses the the Latin philosophia proactiva, and that um, so the the um, the attributive position proactiva is the adjective, so it's ph practical philosophy. So he says it right up front, and then at the very end, the very last page is where he really is quite uh, adamant, and he goes out of his way to say this as a way to conclude this whole thing. Um, and I'll read that sentence, that, that two sentences, because it's the very last page, I think this, these, the very last paragraph of the essay, um, let's see, 
Yeah. He says, so when I speak about hermeneutics here, comma, it is theory. Mm -hmm. There are no practical situations of understanding that I'm trying to resolve by so speaking. Hermeneutics has to do with a theoretical attitude toward the practice of interpretation. Um, and, uh, and I just want to read another sentence there. This theoretic stance only makes us aware reflectively of what is performatively at play in the practical experience of understanding. So there it's just crystal clear, right, that he's establishing that relationship for hermeneutics. Uh, hermeneutics as the theory of practice. Um, um, it, it, is, it, it always harvests a broadened and deepens itself understanding, but that means hermeneutics is philosophy, right? All right, so there is the framing of it. But then in, uh, on the third page for me, page 90, um, he starts to blur the boundaries. So he says, for example, and th these are so short, you don't need to, to find them. He, he you says, know what helped though, John, is if you'd say what, par what the paragraph starts with. Okay. So the paragraph starting, this implies, so it's like m maybe the, the fourth paragraph of the essay. Okay. Uh, the paragraph that starts, this implies. The very end of the paragraph says, Theoria itself is a practice. And then he gives us the Greek. And then um, uh, two, three, four, three or four pages later, the very first sentence in the paragraph you'll see all this holds true for hermeneutics as well. So he says, if you find that paragraph, it says, as the theory of interpretation or explication, it, 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 it is not just a theory. And so you look to see what he means by that. And in the next sentence, he says, it is immediately useful and added advantageous for the practice of interpretation. Okay. so. Um, for me, that's the fascinating part about this essay, which is that he frames it as making that distinction, and then he, in a very interesting way, um, blurs the distinction, blurs the boundary between theory and practice. And so my question um, to folks is this. Um, um, I, I'm wondering whether that isn't not just an instance of the circle, right, but um, maybe the preeminent sort of... Um, um, uh, 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 sort of expression of the hermeneutic circle in the sense that it's it's it is putting its finger on what Gadamer what Heidegger talks about when he says you know a being whose being is an issue for itself that 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 um, the, sort of a theoretical distance that we have isn't the theoretical distance of Descartes or of metaphysics or of science it's not an absolute. Uh, abstraction from our being in the world that um, it's it's finite transcendence right it is it is somehow in some way um, um, uh, a, a, something of a distance that's related to our belonging to the world right so that's the kind of circular relationship it's describing so am I attaching too much mm -hmm. weight to that is my question Okay, so the idea is that if we take Aristotle seriously, theory and practice are actually intertwined. Theory requires practice, practice requires theory. Is this another version of the hermeneutic circle or maybe the core version of the hermeneutic circle? That's yeah. my question. Yeah. Great. Andrew. Okay, thanks, David. I wasn't sure when I was reading this, you know, sometimes you're always looking for uh, what you want to see and you come up with a confirmation bias at the end. <laughs> so that was my main concern. But uh, I did notice this uh, counterposing or these dichotomies throughout the essay, and I thought theory and practice was one. You also have universal in particular, you have rhetoric and techne, um, mm -hmm. what else, subject and object, realism and uh, relativity. Mm -hmm. And so what's going on here? You know, I think you pointed out an important point. Alongside those, uh, Gadamer's way of thinking tends to, I think, blend them together. So he sets up these counter counterpositions, and then later on, we'll show how they're actually referring to the same thing um, at a different scale or level of reality. As I as I as I interpret his dialectical ontology, uh, so the dis distinction is simply preliminary to their merging into one another, and I think that's true for all the dichotomies he sets up. 
Yeah, so you want to say it, it, there's lots of places where this happens in this text, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, John. John, you have to mute. Um, there you go. Are you there? John? There we go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now we can hear you. Okay. Um, there's two things, two points I would like to make, uh, and they both relate, obviously, you're going to know it to Greek philosophy. <laughs> um, the first thing is that Gautamer, um, uh, I think, gets a lot of his distinctions from the Greek, kind of called Greek conceptuality, for the concepts in Greek philosophy. And they are, and that's why we can't translate um, Greek philosophy. That's why all the translations are wrong, because you just can't translate them with English words unless you sort of understand that the same, there's no parallel between these concepts. So um, that's the one thing. And he always, and he often begins by referring to the Greeks because this sets the challenge. And then he brings it up through English. He, he, he restates, reformulates it in our modern language is what the Greeks were trying to get to that we've lost this kind of wisdom. That's the one thing. And this, and the second, my second point is that it's this sort of a macro point, and it's, it's if I'd like to rec, uh, to, to to just uh, refer to the um, reflections on my my philosophical journey, just a, a sentence here it, or two sentences, if, if I may. He says, in fact, the rise of my hermeneutical philosophy must be traced back to nothing more pretentious than my effort to be theoretically accountable for the style of my studies and my teachings, Greek philosophy. Practice came first. In other words, his book on the Philebus. For as long as I can remember, I have been concerned not to say too much and not to lose myself in theoretical constructions, which were not fully made good by experience. So in other words, he had this translation of the Greeks that he couldn't publish or he would have been denounced in Germany. He had to keep it until he had retired. He had this incredible translation or, or interpretation, but that's his truth and method is the justification, is the, is, is the accountability of having the freedom to interpret the way he interpreted the Greeks. That's basically the, the Truth and method is the answer to the question of, of how can you, you know, interpret the Greeks in this way. That's, that's a broad sort of macro view of it. Of course, the whole history of philosophy could be put in there. So that's my re response, yeah. John. I don't know if that responds directly to, to your question or not. But in, in that sense, hermeneutics does still maintain a theoretical philosophical um, element to it. As in Plato and Aristotle, you can see the theory in Aristotle, but again, Gadamer always insists, and he says it here, practice comes first. And that's why it has a priority. Yeah, great. Yeah, makes sense, John. Um, John Arthos, is this helping at all? So a bit, yeah. So uh, Andrew, Andrew does not want to commit yet or doesn't want to commit to the priority that I asked about. Sounds like, because I do agree that all of these polarities or dialectics are always in play. And in a way, they're all related to each other, right? I mean, that's just fundamental. He, oh, and by the way, in the, um, I, I found in the late essay on aesthetics, I, I mentioned this uh, at the, at the, con at the conference, um, in order to get away from dualisms he talks in that essay about a third type of being right which is sort of this in between that heidegger talks about we're always in the in between oscillating back and forth rather than right either a monistic or a dualistic position so um so i don't think andrew says yes to my proposal and uh john um um 
so I so I, so John, one thing that I would say about um, the the thing the quotation from the reflections is that I'm wondering if when he talks about pra his own practice, he isn't talking about his teaching, right? The actual getting up in front of a class and giving a lecture and meeting with students and being a pedagogue, you know, working at a university and working with students, um, just as much as he's talking about uh, interpreting Greek texts. Because that's an actual practice, a real, that's the uh, the Lehrer he talks about at the beginning of this er essay, you know, the Kunstlehrer. Mm -hmm. Okay, Don. Okay. Well, um, no, no, not John. Said... Don, Don Marshall's way. Let's get, I want Don Marshall okay. getting in, John. Well, that's okay. Okay, okay or I'll, I'll let John talk first and I'll talk after. I, but... I'm sure he'll get in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay um yeah there, there's a Gottimer is i think John, also John, also... i think they're the same thing okay. he tells us why he he didn't publish for for 30 years uh he explains that in various places you have to piece it together mm -hmm. but and he 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 wanted to, to to give but but primarily he was it was there's two things he says they're the two foci of an ellipse. There's Greek philosophy and there's hermeneutics, okay? They're equal. It was Greek philosophy and the history of philosophy he was lecturing on, but he said he couldn't publish it because he had to keep a low profile. And he says that two or three times in interviews at least. So, so um, he is talking about that, but behind everything, like <laughs> I just read, like I see the 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 the, the relevance of, of Greek philosophy all over the place in Gadamer. Because of course I studied with him for three years and we just studied Greek philosophy together. Like that's before I even ever read Truth and Method. But uh and and I spent you know many hundreds of hours talking to him too. And and uh but but um and I know that and I mean and I figured out in 1974. He is right. What he says about Greek philosophy is right. And I know classical philosophy hasn't even begun to conceive what he said about the Greeks. Not even begun because it's yeah. it's a bridge too far for them. Okay, great. Great. Thanks, John. I mean, that is where his <laughs> hermeneutics and practice really comes to life in his reading of the Greeks. And his insights about hermeneutics, the more theoretical ones, then come out of his experience of interpreting the Greeks. Right? Yes. Yeah. Thank great. you. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right, Don, go ahead. <laughs> Well, I just want to say he, he points to uh, a sense in which practice is prior to theory. Uh, he, he refers to Aristotle's sense that we can't even begin to do ethical theory unless we already have a sense of what is right and wrong. And that we gained in our socialization, in our growing up, in our being raised a certain way. And if we don't have the proper upbringing, then we don't have anything to reflect on for theory. And I think he thinks hermeneutics works the same way. We learn how to understand in our ordinary social life by talking to people, by interacting with people through conversation. This is something that makes uh, hermeneutics a natural activity. It's not, it's not something artificial, okay? And then the reflection reflects on that. Now, I think he then takes a further step to say, the theory which grows out of the practice also needs to return to the practice. And I think he tries to indicate ways in which theory is valuable for practice. As Aristotle says, ethical theory is not going to teach you what is right and wrong as though you didn't already know it. <laughs> but there is a benefit to reflecting theoretically, and that's a benefit for practical moral and ethical action. And I think Gadamer specifies, we could go over it at some point, but I think he tries to, to lay out the ways in which hermeneutics as a theoretical reflection can support and assist and benefit practice, not tell it what to do, but help it nevertheless. I was muted. Carolyn. <laughs> Thanks. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm in agreement with uh, what um, John Arthos and, and Don Marshall there were, were saying about 
you know, I wrote down what, uh, what John Arthos said about the theoretical, he's trying to think about a theoretical distance that hermeneutics has from the object of understanding that's not the same as metaphysics or, or science or objective self-consciousness. Um, uh, and, I, and I think what we're talking about here is the idea that interpretation, yeah, it always is grounded in praxis, returns to praxis. And I'm, I'm, um, I like the idea of understanding praxis as this kind of being in the world. But um, in light of that, I was wondering if anyone had some ideas about this connection he's making between like praxis and bios, um, because that, that passage was a little obscure to me. Um, I can Do you find have a page this number is, or a paragraph? Front um, yeah, I'm also working with the book version, but it's just a few paragraphs in. Let's see. So if you're if you're in uh, if you're in this volume, then it is page ninety. Yep. Um, is the paragraph that strikes modern ears alone as a piece of sophistry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then it's, it's really that paragraph in the next paragraph where he's trying to think about the nature of this of this praxis and of course um thinking about it not merely in opposition to theoria as as folks are saying but then he adds this other piece about about um the relationship to bios and i don't know for for some reason this this part was a little obscure to me so i wonder if anyone has like a some enlightening uh remarks on this these paragraphs What I thought was happening here, well, first he distinguishes humans from non-human animals and that we can make choices. We have this yeah. kind of pre-choice, not libertarian pre-choice, but we can make choices and an other animals um, can't. And that's, they just have their, but we could talk about bios as more generally the way of life of a living being. It could be a plant or an animal. Um, and so then the ability to make choices within the context of a polis for the sake of an end. I right, will call that sort of proresis. That is part of the bios of being human. So that is part of the way of the way of life for a human being is to live such that we make choices for the sake of an end mm -hmm. in the context of a polis. And so that's so I think he wanted to say later <laughs> that what makes hermeneutics or not hermeneutics theory, but interpretive activity, a praxis, is because we realize to do it well, we need to take seriously who we are, mm -hmm. and we need to take seriously our values and our interests, and how our the understanding that we are arriving at mm -hmm. says something about us and our lives as citizens or something like that. Does that help? Just one quick word on that, because I, I think that's helpful. And I see other people have their hand up too, but it's interesting because, you know, oftentimes when we talk about um, philosophy being grounded in this finitude or this, this kind of being in the world, it's, um, it, or especially like a form of life, <laughs> we tend to think about that form of life as something that's kind of like static and fixed. And here it's like, it's interesting that our form of life is so future oriented, like our form of life is to look ahead and try to make decisions about choices about matters of action right. and i think that that was that's interesting yeah good point i like that I like that don you want to get back in uh, uh maybe it's been covered but uh, the distinction oh, i was just going to say that i think that's a reference to aristotle yeah. um and put the politics where aristotle says that animals have uh praxis but um the uh, all life has praxis, but um, humans uh, have prohyrus, and uh, especially they have the, the highest form of praxis, and um, th th that's in the Aristotle's politics. Yeah, and, and basically, he never says, like, Aristotle never says, just for comparison, like, man is the uh, well, I won't get into that, but basically his Aristotle's classification of of the uh, of the human being is is that uh, he does have a uh, choice and not as he has. Yeah, that's his definition of the of the human being. Okay, good. It's in the politics. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Don Marshall. I'll use first and last names. <laughs> well, yeah. On 
on uh, this page 230 here is the paragraph that starts this strikes modern ears alone as a piece of sophistry okay so he refers to Joachim Ritter to whom he owes a lot he says he says frequently that he owes a lot to Ritter Ritter conceives practice as a mode of behavior of everything living not everything living but things that behave <laughs> okay plants don't behave but pl animals behave but they behave instinctually so they make choices of action they choose to do an action but what moves them is instinct and so they have this kind of fixity what is distinctive about human beings is that uh, they choose a way of life not just life but a way of life and he lists some of these and this echoes aristotle these ways of life include uh, the decision to orient oneself to pleasure, power, honor, knowledge, but also at the bottom of the page, she's, uh, in the next paragraph, he says other differences in life contact, husband and wife, elderly and child, dependents and those who are independent, okay, uh, which comes to slave and free, okay. All of this is human practice where we are choosing not just a particular action, but a way of life oriented towards some good as sort of david uh is saying uh and i think that, that that's is very a very important distinction in his in his mind okay so practice is the actuation of life the energeia actualizing one's life as a way of life okay but human beings can choose this way of life and that means they need a basis on which to choose. And this is where phronesis, phronesis comes in, where phronesis is the rationality of one's choices of action. Yeah. Now I don't know if that helps, but but that's that's how I understand it anyway. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Okay, thanks, Tanya. That helps. Andrew. Andrew, are you still there? Sorry, yeah. It there turns out I actually read a different version. Oh, that's in that book too. I like that uh, book. Well, it's got the title, but it's a different, uh, a different essay. Um, so therefore, I saw something slightly different, but it does work with Carolyn's point. And there, he mentions a couple of times he describes um, hermeneutics as a natural capacity, and I see this as a natural capacity to form unities, uh, which I alluded to before, and I think that dovetails with what Don's talking about. And that's natural capacity that all living things for God will have. Um, so that's why he'll ground it and, and flip things, because in other essays, he'll say that bios distinguishes us from uh, animals, right, uh, or zoon. Uh, but here he's flipping it and saying that, well, animals now actually have bios. Well, that's a typical move, right? Um, but in any case, I wanted to highlight natural capacity. Uh, since I think it works with uh, Carolyn's point. Thanks, David. Okay, great. Niall. Hi. Um, yeah, um, I was struck by Andrew's point. I, I mean, I agree because usually, I mean, when I first read that passage, I thought, well, as I understand it, that Zoe is the biological life, which we share with all animals, right? So I thought there was some sort of general form of naturalness that we share with animals that is closer to the Zoe and the Bios is far more about the human being's ability to speak and act in consort with one another, etc., freely. Um, so there is a little bit of tension there. I didn't fully understand how we share a kind of a bios with animals. I can understand how we share the zoe with animals, but not the bios. So and then, but then later on, he adds that free decision. We are kind of proarisis and 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 um, and bios. But I think going back to the theory. Uh, the theory thing, the theory practice. So I think there is a tension, but I don't know if it's like John has stated the tension very well, I think, but I'm not so sure it's as problematic because I think when he thinks of theoria, he's thinking of Aristotle, right? And when Aristotle talks about theoria, as we all know, he's thinking about that which is always true, right? It's a reflection on that which is always true or that which is true for the most part, right? When he talks about praxis, Aristotle is talking about what, that which can be otherwise, 
mm-hmm. right? namely human life in its kind of fluid and fleeting nature. So in one way, you can say a theoria is a praxis insofar as thinking is a doing, but it's not a praxis like political pra- praxis, et cetera. So, and, and I think he's clear then he wants to, in some way, talk about, well, hermeneutics is not just a theory. So he has that phrase, it's not just a theory, because in some way, it's not a theory as a reflection on that which is always true but a reflection on the fluidity and the contingency and situatedness of human life. So in some way I get the tension, but in another way, I don't really feel the worry as much, right? About the, this, this tension between, is it a theory? Is it not yeah. a theory, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. I, don't know if that's, um... I, I wanted to, I'll give you a second, Carolyn. I wanted to put an example out that I had in mind, especially John, going back to your first question about, hermeneutics as the theory of interpretation versus the practice of interpreting a text. And and I can go with what, what the, the way Naya uh, put it. You can think about um, Gadamer's reading these Greeks, right, interpreting their works, working through Plato. And in the process, as he comes to have these experiences of realization of meaning, he also recognizes that a good interpretation doesn't look for the psychology of the author. It doesn't ask behind, for the intentions behind the task, text, but looks to ask what question is this text an answer to? So that would be the theoretical level, right? He realizes a general insight here that when we're interpreting, the best interpretation is one that finds the answer, finds the text as an answer to a question. So that's the theoretical insight that comes out of the practice of interpreting which he then only comes to realize better as he continues to practice it and becomes more aware of how this dynamic of question and answer plays itself out. And you can say the same thing about the anti-psychology stuff, about the the assumption of coherence. And I think there's a few things where you can say, this is Gadamer's theory of hermeneutics. He thinks that these are unchanging, that this, if you know a medieval commentator was reading Aristotle, that person should have been doing this exact same activity if they wanted a good interpretation. But it only makes sense once you have gone through the practice of interpreting, and then you can come to realize it, and then that becomes clarified as you continue to to practice. So I just wanted an example. The example was recognizing the text as an answer to a question, as kind of the theoretical level, a theoretical statement. He could say all interpretation has to do this but it's connected to practice because it's only something you realize out of practice. So John, is that something about the dynamic between theory and practice you were talking about at the beginning as example? Yeah, right, although um, the, 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 the lesson I always remember that he gives us about that is that the text hits us. It, 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 uh, uh, it takes us aback, right? It jars us uh, into a moment of, of recognition or you know and so and so that works for me i i um I, so but i want to be clear i'm not worried about this i actually don't want to lose this tension um mm-hmm. i um the 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 i mean it's a paradoxical relationship like we're, we're you know the question is always how do we get into the circle or how do we get out of it and and so so I really like what Don what Don said about um, that 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 uh, her, that the theory emerges out of the practice, right? Now that's repeating, and, and and in this essay, I think he repeats, but also intensifies Heidegger's point, right? Which is that um, that um, we you know we're always already you know, and we're all philosophizing, right? So Gadamer really thinks everybody has to become a philosopher, right? He, he thinks that's part of what makes us human, which is which is really great to hear. He doesn't want us to sort of leave these things to experts. Um, but um, in terms of the tension, again, um, the, 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 so, so, so Heidegger says, you know, we, we, we have, you know, it's sort of the, the when he talks about a being whose being is an issue for itself, he's still in the realm of the ontic, right? But then Heidegger himself blurs the relationship between the ontic and the ontological, um, um, and that's kind of what thinking is doing. It's on the theoretical side, right? 
Um, it's responding to these things that that come to us out of our our being in the world. Um, so uh, you know that's you know factical life. Um, so I see him in accord with Heidegger in that in this sort of relationship, this very difficult relationship between practice, which is first, which is really great. I love that. And then this thing is emerging out of practice, but how does it do that? That's, and then what you said, David, it, you know, it's, we, we're jarred out of our complacency, right? We're living just sort of not, we're, think, we're living like animals. And then something hits us like a text or a painting or a piece of music. And that jars us into thinking about things and becoming reflective about them. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Carolyn, did you want to still get in here? Um, well, actually, I want to, I think what, Na I, I want to invite Nancy to <laughs> see yeah, if okay. she wants to elaborate on her point here, because I'm, and I, I now find myself just um, wondering what she, what she had in mind there, because uh, I think that what she mentions here about the activity and situatedness may help move along this discussion. Yeah, that's great. Nancy, do you, can you clarify for us? Say more well, about it? I think the reason that struck me is because nursing is always struggling between what they're calling a, a theory and practice gap, you know, that, you know, the knowing the theory and, and knowing how to practice it well, it, it, it seems to find a gap a, a lot of times. And so I, I think that for me, that point that Gadamer made about um, be, between activity and situatedness, that's sort of the, the practice theory marriage in there. I don't know if that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You, do you have an, a, an example, something? Well, I'll give the example of Kate Wong, for example, who works with uh, children that are dying in hospice. Mm -hmm. And um, so Kate kind of knows about palliative care and about, you know, caring for children that are dying, but she also has become good at it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like, so the fact that she has been present at the deaths of many, many children um, and has learned through that experience um, means she's particularly good at that theory that she might've learned in school. So, yeah. I mean, that's a really concrete example, but it's the kind of thing that we're faced with all the time because we actually have to, practice what it is that we do so and we have you know and we get good at it when we practice so. yeah Sometimes. ideally right you hope so <laughs> kate did you want to give an example of this did you want to speak to this since you've been invited you've been invited in i know you're here <laughs> well i i was thinking about um sometimes there's a, a phrase nurse's intuition too. And I don't know that intuition is always the right word because it's an informed intuition. So it's a bit more like that practical wisdom than the gut feeling that they talk about in nursing sometimes that you just know something is wrong. Well, you know something is wrong because you've seen it before, you've experienced it before. Mm -hmm. And newer nurses don't necessarily have that um, sense of phronesis yet or that sense of practical wisdom yet. So. And in an area like mine, where you don't have a lot of quantitative evidence to base your practice on, it does come down to experience over time and applying other experiences and theory into the current situation, which is never the same. So it, it is an art in that sense, too. Yeah, no, OK, that makes sense. Yep. So uh, John Beach. Thanks. John, I think you need to unmute. I think, as Gautamer says, go. the uh, putting theory and practice together sounds like sophism to us, because this is because we're moderns. And it's a real stumbling block. It's a real conceptual stumbling block for us. And, um, the, uh, and I would see it as, I mean, I think the Greeks and Gadamer and hermeneutics want to see it as a continuum. And uh, maybe the, maybe I, I'm not, I, I have to think about the circle idea, but the, um, in, in, in the quote I, I read where, where in 
in the RPF, which is his final word on sorting things out, um, reflections on his philosophical journey, he says, it's just the um, giving an accounting of the practice. In other words, the, the truth of hermeneutics rests totally on his practice, which was his incomparable knowledge of the Greek language, which was, uh, uh, which, which is the base of it. So there, and therefore, um, so, so it's sort of a, a theoretical uh, in theory. It's, it's sort of explaining the, like how practice is the way it is and how it works the way it is, it does. Like you can do it and know the praxis, but not really have an understanding of as a, as a theoretic. And finally, I, I would just add that he, he calls, he says, uh, theory is the highest form of praxis. He says that in that interview uh, with uh, Datari, and also Heidegger says the same thing in what is called thinking, uh, essentially. So we have to get beyond our modern conceptuality, which he's, which is, you know, implanted imminently in our consciousness and our our unconscious, and and that's what we're dealing with, and that's what we're struggling with, and that's why John's Arthur's question is is such an excellent question, I think. Oh, sorry, I'm muted. Don Marshall. Sorry. Thanks, John. Don Marshall. Uh, I've, I've had a chance to talk and I'll get a chance to say what I'm after, but I'd rather hear from William Contract, who hasn't spoken. Great. OK, William. Okay. Oh, OK, well, th thank you. I guess I, um, I, I wanted to ask a little further down about a question about uh, the good. Um, in this uh, on page, I think it's uh, uh, to uh, and thank you, Don. By, by the way, um, the on two thirty one it says in any case, um, practical philosophy has to be accountable with its knowledge for the viewpoints in terms of which one thing is to be preferred to another, the relationship to the good. And on the next page, he talks about how the good involves uh, things like the best way of life uh, or about the best constitution of the state. And what I was wanting to get uh, discuss is what, what he may be meaning by the good here and also consider it in relation to his other writings on Plato and Aristotle. Because else, elsewhere he talks in the idea of the good, um, when he's drawing upon Plato, it, 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 there's a sense of a good beyond being, not just the, this practic the practical sense here, but also a good beyond being. Um, and also all things uh, um, pursue the good, not just humans. So there's that broader sense. So I just wanted to bring uh, that up and um, yeah, as a start anyways. Okay, let me, let me uh, say for those of you with the other translation, this is about Three pages in, the paragraph begins, since practice comprises the broad range of significance in Greek, and then goes on to the next paragraph, which is its object of study is not only the constantly changing situations and modes of conduct, and so on. So hopefully if you have a different, you have the translation from a different source, you can track that down. Um, this strikes me as, as a new question, a new direction, which I'm happy to move on to. I just want to know, Don Marshall, did you want to say something about the relationship between theory and practice before well, we go I, on to what is the what is God mean by the good? Well, I thought that uh, Nancy raised a critical question with the question of situation, mm. the hermeneutical situation. Okay, so let me make two short points, and then I really want to address that because I'd like to go on with that a little. I think yep. William Konchak has raised a very good point. I want to suggest that there may be a parallel between the good as the orienting object of practical action, of ethical action, and understanding as the oriented as the orienting object of interpretation. Hmm. So that understanding and understanding is to hermeneutics what the good is to ethics. Okay, that may be too blunt, but uh, you get you get the idea. When we were talking about choice and the choice of the way of life, what is misleading about the word choice is that it seems to our minds, I think, to suggest an individual's autonomous activity. And that is not what Gautamer thinks is going on. When we make an ethical choice, it is not that we on our own simply decide we will do this because it's good. It is always in a social context where we have been raised 
in a world where these things are good, these things are bad, there's a social agreement about what's good and bad, okay? And in the same way, in the hermeneutic situation, we do not freely choose some text and then freely decide how to interpret it, <laughs> okay? The text comes to us. It comes into a hermeneutical situation, uh, a phrase he uses on page 242 here. So this is three or four pages from the end. It's toward the end. And the paragraph starts, one place where it starts is elaborating the hermeneutic situation, da, 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 da. So the idea that interpretation is elaborating the hermeneutic situation means it's understanding sort of what brought us this text. It's understanding the situation of the text, the context and world that it comes from, but it's also understanding our situation as interpreters, because we don't just choose to read a text. A text comes to us in a situation of our life and under circumstances that more or less impose on us the task of understanding it. We feel that we need to understand this, that for our own uh, understanding, we need to understand it. Okay, uh, And the resources we use for this are our capacity to understand, which is something that developed in a social world in our interaction with others. And we use language, which comes to us as a social product, not something we made up. OK, uh, so in this sense, elaborating the situation, as he goes on to say, means that we have to recognize in the questions the text answers our own questions. We have to see that these are our questions and we are understanding in order to answer those questions. Uh, on 243, he goes on further in that paragraph to say something I did not really understand that we have to understand and explicate our interests in the interpretation and in understanding in the direction and limits indicated by our hermeneutic interest. Okay, uh, So I think situation is really critical here. It's a very subtle notion. It's a very complicated notion, but I think it's really central. We are in a hermeneutic situation, which is fundamentally social. Uh, as our understanding is fundamentally so social, as our means of understanding, the medium of our understanding is fundamentally social, okay? Uh, and we need to elaborate this and become self-aware uh, in the process. That's the gain of interpretation. That's why it's a good thing that we have to interpret, <laughs> okay? So, so I'll, I'll stop there. Sorry to go on so long. All right, thanks, Don. <laughs> okay, William, I don't know if your hand was up from before or if you put your hand up again. It was up from before. I mean, I, I liked how it linked a bit to the, the theory um, um, and I could go into that more, but maybe I'll let the other people speak and, and go from there. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, uh, Niall. Yeah, um, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to speak, connect Nancy's points back to Don's, I think, yeah, the situation. But historically, it's interesting because so most of us will know that Gadamer in some way, I wouldn't say dined out, but he 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 referred a lot to that early essay by Heidegger on Aristotle, you know, which was indications of a hermeneutical situation, it was called. Right. That's a really important fact that Gadamer obviously found that, that Heidegger's analysis of this hermeneutical situation as kind of as grist for the mill as he was building his own hermeneutical theory. But in that text, Heidegger talks precisely about the pre-theoretical, uh, he talks about the theoretical prejudice, which I think is relevant here, right? There's a theoretical prejudice and what the theoretical prejudice brings with it is a kind of um, some distanciation from life. So through this act of reflection on what is always true or on actuality instead of possibility, we have the, the loss of the world in some way, right? And I think Gadamer is following him there and it's saying, how can we think about a pre-theoretical situation? So it's, it's not, in some way, praxis is pre-theoretical. Uh, but I think Gadamer then is, 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 is wise enough to, 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 to know that when you're doing philosophy, you're always in the theoretical attitude as well, right? So when he writes this essay, an act of essay writing is essentially a theoretical act, right? He's putting things in a certain order. We might be, as David was saying, we might be happy with one essay, less happy with another. 
that's very much a theoretical evaluation of his work. So it's a theoretical act. But I think the attempt to draw on Heidegger is to root the theoretical act, this writing an essay, in conversation. Is so that the, 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 the theory doesn't, doesn't take leave of the praxis altogether, that it starts from the praxis and returns to the praxis. So this idea of, I think the last point is, Heidegger's claim is the theoretical attitude leads to the petrification of life. He says at one stage, it stills the stream of life that's found in praxis. Uh, and how can we then, so Heidegger then develops this idea, this very early idea, which he calls hermeneutic intuition, which is odd to go back to Kate's point, where intuition is seen as a bad word. Heidegger takes the concept of intuition. He says, it's this ability of hermeneutics to stay close to the movement of life and not take a distance from life, but stay in life. And at the same time, do a hermeneutical analysis of life. So how does theory, how does theory uh, stay close to praxis and not lose, like, lose sight of it? I think, I think Gadamer is just, as John was saying, this, this fact, factical life, he's reworking those very ideas, but those very early ideas between theory and practice that Heidegger has with emphasis on the pre-theoretical attitude and not the petrification of this natural movement of life that he finds rooted back in conversation, I think. So I, I, I see that's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm saying the same thing as Don and John have, has been saying, but I think the reference to Heidegger is a helpful backstory and gives us a kind of a type of scaffolding to talk further about Gadamer. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. John Arthur. Yeah, I do think this is drawing a lot of these threads together. And so I wanted to try to connect the, the last thing that Don said to what uh, Nancy and Kate were talking about um, in relationship to the good, right? So, um, you know, Don is, you know, that feels right to me that uh, 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 Gadamer starts, us, we're embedded in a particular situation, right? But there is within that particular situation always a kind of latent theorizing going on, right? So there's the, he talks about it as a sense of direction. Heidegger talks about it as a formal indication. There is this, we're, we're always already in the circle, right? Um, and so when I think about uh, the example that you gave, Nancy, of uh, a child, dying and, and, and palliative care. So a nurse is trained in school in the abstract before she has to face, or he has to face that situation, um, you know, end of life therapy or whatever that would entail, but then has to come face to face with it, with a child, you know, and that just surpasses and transcends anything that you were taught in a textbook, right? Um, and so to me, he, he uh, Gadamer starts to tell us what that relationship is between the particular and the general really well in Truth and Method when he talks about the relationship of case and principle in legal theory, right? So we have these, we have, we try to anticipate everything when we write these laws, but we never do. There's always this difficult case that comes up that actually changes the law. We have to find some accommodation and it sort of retroactively has to transform the law itself, right? So there's that same kind of relationship going on there between the particular and the general. The particular is always modifying the general. And that's the thing that hermeneutics does so well. You know, we no longer can subsume things under a category. We're always, you know, in this circular way, transforming our principles. Yeah, great. There's that hermeneutic circle again. Yeah, Carolyn. Yeah, um, I guess I, I, I think that the discussion that's happened now of hermeneutic situation, which I find very helpful, it, it, it circles back to a comment that I made in the chat earlier, insofar as one of the topics that I was interested in is the way that Gadamer um, distinguishes interpretation as it occurs in a hermeneutic way from like ideology critique and even like the psychoanalytic interpretation. Um, and it, I think the discussion that's happening of the hermeneutic situation now is, is helpful for making sense of that distinction because in ideology critique and psychoanalytic interpretation, if I following Gadamer, you know, he says, um, it's like you, you're kind of reducing 
the text to a set of like given interests or motivations, you know, you say this because you have this class interest or, or whatever. Um, and that strikes me as, you know, it, it, very different than what he sees um, the task of, inter of, of hermeneutic interpretation being insofar as it's not just a kind of, um, well, first of all, there's not this kind of enlightenment move where, okay, now, now we reveal what really is. Now we finally have the true answer of like what's going on behind the scenes, um, behind the ideology or behind the, behind the, um, the ego or whatever. Um, but I also think that this is, helpful at this discussion of the good because in ideology critique and psychoanalytic interpretation there's not often that gesture of saying like that when the interpretation takes place what what's still on the table is this question of of, of the good <laughs> right it's just kind of like that that's absent from that and so i guess i guess that that um contrast in the essay was was interesting to me how he how he was um trying to kind of carve out this, this different possibility of interpretation um, in juxtaposition to these other interpretations that he says are kind of like, you know, he says like with Nietzsche, this kind of, uh, this, this everyone uh, uh, starts to think about interpretation as, um, as, as, as radical doubt and critique, right? He says only when our entire culture for the first time saw itself threatened by radical doubt and critique did hermeneutics become a matter of universal significance. And so I take it that one of the things that's happening in the essay is him trying to carve out this other way of thinking about interpretation over and against that, that historical emergence. I, that was a lot there, but. All right, great, thank you. So maybe we should uh, look at the passages that William brought up explicitly, where Gadamer talks about the good. Just because, I mean, the reason it seems a little unintuitive to me is it seems like I can perfect, I can interpret something perfectly well without invoking my own understanding of the good. I mean, I'm reading all sorts of medieval stuff now, and I can read and say, "Oh, Aquinas is worried about angels." And that's what makes sense of it. And at no point have I been engaged in this process. I don't worry about how angels fit into my philosophical positions. How do angels interpret? Things like this, right? So I feel like there's ways in which I interpret, but at no point are questions of the good being ignited. And at that point, I mean, maybe God was saying, well, you're not really doing hermeneutic interpretation. There are other sorts of things going on here. And so maybe we'd, I'd, I would like to look at the sort of what, William was pointing at, so I can understand better the ways in which, in any really hermeneutic interpretation, the relationship to the good is is called forward. Is that is that okay? William, you want to do you want to take us through those passages? Yeah, because um, yeah, cause basically, I guess my impression here is that like I mean these passages are fairly straightforward, sort of about the, the practical good. And what I was trying to reconcile that was uh, with his greater reading of the good with respect to Plato and, and Aristotle and, and how that could still be practical. Like, like your question is a very a good one. Like, how is that useful to my interpretive practice or, 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 or whatnot or, or, or life? And, and that's what I, I wanted to bring out, how there's this greater sense of the good um, that one can find elsewhere in Gadamer's interpretations. Yeah. Okay. And that that's really your stuff, right? That the yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> the Plato Aristotle stuff and how we need to read everything through that lens, right? Do you want to say something more about his on a tip on the top of your head about what he says about Plato and Aristotle on the good and how well it fills it, out it, this it, picture? It, it, yeah, well, it's just more, what I wanted to emphasize here. I mean, he, he goes against uh, Aristotle's criticism of Plato that the good isn't practical, uh, like if, if, uh, in life. So it's 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 useful for life, and and um, so there's that sense that I was ho hoping uh, to bring out here, um, and and also um, like like his reading of practical philosophy here, I think, differs from how how it is in the idea of the good, and even even the uh, paper we read last time. 
Um, so it's to, to how to get this sense of a, a greater whole in here that I don't think is quite uh, captured within this text that one could find last in last uh, time's text and one can find in the idea of the good as well. Okay, thanks. And it's not, do you feel like he's not being consistent? That he's revised his view? Yeah. Or that this is a, you think he's revised his view? And well, this... for instance, earlier, he, he's he's criticizing earlier for for um, um, showing the distance of the ideal from from the, the practical or the material. And and that's the different approach than he takes in the idea of the good. He emphasizes the Mephexis participation there. Right. So 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 if I were to kind of take on that later, that's, you know, try to consider these later thoughts, how they might apply to here is what I'm yeah. trying to. Work OK. Through. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah. Now, Marshall. Well, I I just want to raise uh, uh, within the larger question of the good, which is a very far reaching question. Obviously, yeah. 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 But there's a specific application in this area, and that is the distinction uh, between um, certain kinds of action. So phronesis is an action where I perform the action because I think it's going to lead to the good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I always have to ask that question, uh, Gadamer insists. When I'm, when I'm trying to decide what to do, I can't just decide what will work, but whether what will work will be beneficial, will be lead to the good. And that's different from what, he, what Aristotle calls the denotes, you know. So if I want to rob a bank and I don't want to get caught, it would be prudent for me to wear a mask. But Aristotle says, this is not, in fact, phronesis. This is just cunning, cleverness, the denotes. It's something different, okay? Because it's not oriented toward the good. And that distinguishes within action. Uh, I, I would say, uh, to, to be able to get a little reductive about it, the hermeneutic difference is, I, I'm sorry, I'm an old English teacher, okay? I, that's my, my background, okay? And I see people who interpret texts in a completely heartless way. They are simply manipulating the terms and the symbols of the text, just laying out structures. You have no idea why they're doing this. It's very clever. But it doesn't get the heart of the matter. It misses the point. Okay, And I think in Hermeneus, he's thinking of something very similar. Interpretation is not a matter of cleverness. It's a matter of insight into the subject of the text, into the zacha, into the subject matter of the text. And there's no substitute for that insight. OK, uh, so I, I think there's a, a sort of specific narrower area within the good where the good comes up uh, in, in that way. OK. Yeah, it's great. And you might say, too, it's not a matter just of technique. Like, see where class is at stake in the discussion, right? And then see the ways in which it plays out and to see ways in it as if it, you have this template and it's just a matter of applying the template. Can I just add one other point? I happen to have been reading Epictetus's discourses. <laughs> okay. And in the discourses, he constantly rails against mere school book learning. People who just want to learn how to, how to examine complicated syllogisms, but who do not live the philosophy that they're studying. <laughs> you know, the point of philosophy is life and the practice of life, not the clever manipulation of syllogisms. Okay, so it's the same kind of distinction, I think. Yeah, great point. Yeah, Karen, I want to get Karen Davis in here, John. She hasn't spoken up yet. Thanks, Dave. So I was just thinking about how the, the idea of, uh, so like linking interpretation and the good, I'm gonna try to make this make sense. Okay, that linking the interpretation, the process of interpretation and the good reminded me of what Gadamer had to say about progress. So this is on page 240 in that version, the beginning of the paragraph is, nevertheless, when we examine the range of these new insights. And he talks about, um, how he's not looking for a linear idea of progress, but um, sort of appreciating a relentless tension. And that just, so, so thinking about interpretation as a move leading toward the good, um, if, if that's a relevant concept, then perhaps the good that we are trying to progress 
chords is itself a kind of tension between the activity and the situatedness, right? Like that practice between activity and situatedness where, where the situation is, uh, sorry, John, it was page 240 um, in my version of the text. Hopefully someone else can give you a paragraph in the other version if you need it. Um, but like the tension is, is where, um, where the situation is what transcends, right? Where it's, it's the situatedness or the imminence that that transcends our sense of theory or truth. And so the, the, what we usually think of as given is what forces us into activity in order to rethink what we thought was always true, right? And that that is the sort of tension that we want to hold on to that's the good in interpretation that we're trying to work towards, not some sense of progress. Yeah, I thought that would. Can I can I ask you a question, Karen? Because because uh, Don had this analogy earlier that understanding is yeah. good. Does what you said sound like? It sounds to me like a description of what we call hermeneutic understanding. Yeah, I, that's. Fair? I was yeah. yes. I think I think that is right. I think I was I was trying to sort of fit those pieces together. That like that. So what Don said earlier, right, is that understanding orients interpretation, just like the good orients practical philosophy. And if hermeneutics is practical philosophy, which is the title of the essay, then, then certainly there's some kind of good in understanding that we're trying to reach. Yeah, I think I, that analogy. I, if, if, if I could answer that too, you know, it, may, it makes sense. I think there's a close connection between truth and goodness. And so if hermeneutics is about pursuing truth, you can argue it's about uh, pursuing goodness, uh, pursuing the subject matter with integrity, ethical integrity to uh, bring out what it reflects and have the courage to bring one's own prejudices into questions rather than pushing them forward. And, and I think in that sense, since this essay also considers Habermas and critical theory, there's a certain sense there uh, what answer the good might have for overcoming systematic distortion. So that even within the hermeneutic situation, there's a th theoretical orientation, which isn't about stepping outside it per se, but it's about transcending it into an intensified kind of relationality that brings us back to a new level of self-understanding, something like that. Unmute. Uh, Don Marshall, did you want to get in on this topic? specifically your uh, hand yeah, came well, up as well, soon as i quoted you point, so i figured it must be yeah point point of personal privilege or something i mean <laughs> I, I i think understanding but he also talks about self-understanding and the self-understanding that comes out of the hermeneutic experience comes out of the experience of interpretation and he talks in the essay about this the experience of interpretation teaches you something it teaches you that you may be wrong <laughs> that you may have prejudices that you need to control and control for, <laughs> that uh, other people think other things. So that at one point he puts this rationality, someone who's rational, be reasonable, reasonable as he calls it, someone who's reasonable, what that means is they resist the temptation of dogmatism, as in be reasonable. <laughs> you know? yeah. So I think there is a good not just understanding it's so just not understanding a text that's not just that's not the point it's also understanding yourself and understanding the the capacities unapologetically the capacities and also the limitations of your own thinking and understanding mm -hmm. and i think going back to aristotle one of the main differences between a praxis versus a techne even theoria is that there are ends internal to it it's not just successful if you've made a boat or ruled a state. Is that it's only it's also only successful if it's also developed your character in certain ways, developed virtues in you in certain ways, and that's essential to the value of the. Of the that's what makes it a praxis, as opposed to other things. These sort of virtues of recognizing that there are you know, in, uh, elevated self understanding. John Beach. Yeah. Um... My uh, just sort of to to uh, to respond to William, I think that it's it's not too clear, but I think 
when he's talking about Plato, uh, Plato's distinction, I think that he's saying, well, this is not what, what we mean. We're not talking about this sort of a distinction. Uh, it's not related to what the, the distinction he's trying to make here. And, um, uh, and I think regarding the good, it, uh, it's, uh, we have to deal with prohibus, right? We have to deal with a, a decision and every decision, as long as every decision is made <clears throat> with a good in mind. In other words, like the Greek word would be a, a hexis, uh, a striving for the good, like that's, that's only, uh, that's an ethical act. And um, so, so I, that's the way I see it uh, connected to acting. That was all. Yeah, that makes what, sense. <laughs> yeah, and, and what I was trying to point is like what I think you're right in the text there, he's pointing to uh, what he's arguing that Plato has in that is uh, not what he's looking for. But my, my point is that in his later texts, uh, I, I don't know if he would have said that because he would generally emphasize the uh, notion of participation with Plato. Oh, oh, yeah, no, no, it's a completely that's what different... you were referring to. I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly what I'm referring to. It's a completely different issue, though. And that's why well, it's not clear in this translation. But okay, see, I mean, when Gadamer writes about uh, Timaeus, here's an example. He said, well, you know, the 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 Demiurgos makes all these things, does all these wonderful things. And then for the creation of, 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 of the humans, he gets these kind of lesser gods to do that kind of disordered world of humanity and so on. So He's he, so there's that sort of uh, you know the the, the finitude and th th that's so that's the relation of the ideal to the to to, to, to what's on earth. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's not so it's not what what he's trying to get at with uh, praxis here. And mm -hmm. I, just as one last thing, I'd like people to comment on um, um, theoria theoria as being the highest form of praxis. Like, do you, do you get that? Can you can you understand that? So why would Teoria be the highest form of praxis for a human being? Yeah, yeah, because Gadamer, that's what Gadamer says. And, yeah. Well, he says, yeah, in the, uh, um, and, and Heidegger says it too in what is called thinking. He says, you know, maybe we've been just acting too much and thinking too little here, you know? And this is our problem. So like, that's, I think, a, a challenge because our concepts of, of practice and, and, you know, activity, action, praxis, and theory are not, uh, don't jibe with, with hermeneutics at all. What, what throws me is the highest to claim the, that, that word. So I would think if I was Aristotle, someone would be the highest if it if it actualized the perfections which were most distinctive of my nature, we'll put it like that. And as a rational choosing human being, then the highest activities would be the activities that perfected my nature as a rational choosing human being. And then we have book 10 of the ethics, which is then about yeah. theorizing, right? So I think, uh, but I'm not sure Godmer has the same view of human beings as Aristotle. I'll quote you. Okay. I, I believe you. It just, I would think the only way it makes sense of that is by saying something quite different about what we are as human beings, as creatures that engage in interpretive understanding or something like this. Well, no, no, I think uh, Aristotle would agree with, or Gadamer and Aristotle are, are together on this um, because, and Gadamer says elsewhere somewhere, I can't remember, mm -hmm. but to be really truly ethical, uh, to do, you have to sort of know uh, know why, and you have to know a little bit more about it. And and, and the same, the craftsman, the one who who has the theory, who understands why he he does this practice, he's the better craftsman. He's the higher craftsman. Mm -hmm. So the theory always perfects it, brings to a higher level. And and just to here's a. Um, there's a question that Dottori asks. Um, 
he says, um, would you, would theoria in the Greek sense also be pract praxis? And Gadamer says, yes, the highest form of praxis. Okay. In, I was just going to say in Plato's dialogue, uh, dialectical ethics, he talks uh, about how, well, he relates really the good and the beautiful to what to what entities are uh, when they're um, being what they are in their own nature. So there's some sense that mm -hmm. I think uh, he says, let's see, um, entities themselves as their own nature. So um, the sense of, of, of harmonious proportion and the beautiful and the good. So you could, maybe we could look at theory as that, as, mm -hmm. a, as a, a, a rich coming back to oneself. Yeah, I agree with what David said about that. Like I, that's, that, I agree, that's what Aristotle says. Yeah, sure. And um, yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, I, but this is what Gadamer's talking about Plato there in his reading of the Philebus that I was referring to. Oh, Gadamer's talking about Plato where? I was talking about his reading of the Philebus in Plato's Dialectical Ethics. I was just trying to get okay. back to the point of, of, of theoria as um, you know a highest form of praxis. So uh, yes. some sense of coming back in a harmonious way to oneself. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I wanted to, before we too too far along. I wanted to ask a question of, about Karen put in the in the chat, which is also part of her her uh, topic, and that was. Um, her when uh the equivalence of hermeneutics is practical philosophy the way i read that is that if we think of the different kinds of philosophy that aristotle talks about hermeneutics belongs to the category of practical philosophy but you want to say it's no it's it's the equivalence is tighter than that hermeneutics is what practical philosophy is about or something like this oh you're muted I still oh, there you go good oh yeah. i <laughs> I feel hesitant to argue that in this crowd because it feels like <laughs> But yeah, I think yeah. there is something about um, the ways that that uh, yeah, that um, because it is about like like thinking about our interests, right, and getting back. To questions that precede the statements that we make. I think the process of hermeneutic inquiry and understanding is an ethical process and that, okay. that yeah, maybe I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. That's what I wanted to get, get clear on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don Marshall. Well, I think that's just right. <laughs> what uh, was, was, uh, you know, what you were saying there is, is just right. Uh, it, it isn't that hermeneutics is practical philosophy, but just as theoretical philosophy uh, has its subdivisions, physics, okay, uh, mathematics, theoretical knowing has its subdivisions, uh, physics, mathematics, theology, i.e. metaphysics, okay. Practical philosophy has its subdivisions, politics as the highest, okay, ethics, okay, rhetoric, and I think he thinks hermeneutics also. And I think hermeneutics does have, uh, in getting the good, it has a, it has a, a beneficial effect. It, you gain self-understanding. And I, I tried to think about this because I think it's very much the question: what, what does, what does hermeneutics do for you ethically? <laughs> okay, uh, and what does theory do for you? What does theory do for you? Uh, as an interpreter. And I, I think it does a number of things. For one thing, it shows that it's is it hermeneutics and practical philosophy is different from theoretical science. And it's very important that we know this, that we know that there is something other than theoretical methodological science, our modern methodical science. It also shows us that what we do in interpretation has its validity. We also very much need to know this, that what we're doing is not just some, uh, what we do while waiting for the scientists to arrive. It is its own thing. It has its own validity. As Aristotle says, it would be ridiculous to ask for geometric arguments in, uh, in ethics. Ethics has its own validity. It, we also teaches us not to demand definitive interpretations, not to be dogmatic, not to think that uh, any interpretation is forever. They have to be constantly renewed 
in the so world of social interaction. And it also teaches us to uncover our own prejudices and hold them in check so that we understand, but not on the model of scientific objectivity. It's a different model of holding ourselves back uh, as he says at one point of truth, the method, accepting some things against ourselves, even though we're, nothing requires us to do this, this kind of self-restraint. These are ethical things. These are things that make a human being a certain kind of human being. So a good interpreter becomes a certain kind of human being. It is a, a human activity, and it is something that that has a good, that it orients toward the good generally as practical philosophy always does okay so yeah no that's great i i might add sorry to jump over you john Arthur, i might add that here, here's the kind of argument you might make too and i'm thinking of, of uh katie here dealing with her patients or kate um what aristotle says if you are the front of us if you're wise you see what the right thing to do in a situation is so kate has her experience she sees the way she is supposed to act in that situation as a result of her experience and acts appropriately with respect to the child who's suffering. Um, now, I would say that is an interpretation. It's maybe a perceptual interpretation, but it's an interpretation of the situation in such a way that she sees the way to act in that situation. And if that's fair, I think that's a reasonable way to talk about it. Well, that means that all wisdom is interpretation. All recognition of what a situation calls for is a kind of interpretation of the situation. And so at some level, it's hermeneutic. And that'd be a different kind of argument than what Don was making, but it's also about why you could think of all practical philosophy as hermeneutic, because anytime we recognize what a situation calls for, we are enacting an interpretation. But Kate, did you want to get in on this? I was just saying to bring up Don's point again about holding our prejudices in check too. I also have pre-understandings about children and childhood that often get challenged in practice too and have to force me to reevaluate what the right thing to do is as well because here are these children that are having what most consider to be an adult experience and how do we kind of decide what the right thing to do is given that you only get one death um, we don't expect children to die and we don't all we often underestimate how children understand their situation how they understand death so it gets very complicated in those situations and, and it takes a little bit of time to reflect on those. And sometimes we have to act very quickly in that situation too. Sometimes there are emergencies that call for our, our practical wisdom to come up right away. And you don't always have the, the time you wish for to reflect on that, but you do for the next experience where, you know, if something goes wrong, I can think about what I might do next time. Yeah, so to tie, so Kate, stay with me. To tie in what, uh what um, John Beach was saying, do you think part of what makes you an excellent nurse is that you do that reflective work? That you're sort of stepping back you're and doing- assume, You're making doing, a big assumption there about my- <laughs> Well, you talked about doing it when you have time, but you do sort of do the theory too. And you say, yeah, and that's what actually, that's a big part of being a good nurse is you do the, you, when you have a chance to step back and think about it, you do. Yeah, I think that's what's been so wonderful about grad school is that it's given me the time and the space to step away from my practice and think about it differently. And the interesting thing is that um, I'm still practicing, so I can kind of look at what my work was like before I knew about hermeneutics and what it was like after. Yeah. And and I'm still th that's still something I'm sorting out for myself, but I, I really think it makes me a better nurse. And I've had comments from colleagues about um, you know, you're really trying a lot harder to understand situations and interpret situations than, you know, what some of us are doing is that we just assume we know what's going on. Um, we assume that this child doesn't understand that they're dying when they might actually. And what are the consequences of those assumptions? And what are the consequences of not trying to understand situations differently? Yeah, yeah, great. John, you get the award for the most patient today. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kate. That helps. Yeah, so I have two sort of opposite reactions to the relationship between hermeneutics and practic practical philosophy as we've been talking about. It. So uh, practical philosophy, practical wisdom, pra practical reason, which, you know, it seems to me that Gautamer develops 
in relationship to the Nicomachean ethics, right, the, as a primary text. So the first part, the, so I have a positive um, reaction in relationship to the question Karen was raising about the relationship between interpretation and ethics. So if you orient yourself to the to to Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, that's pretty easy to do, right? Those are he Goddard would probably say that separating interpretation and ethics is sort of a modern disease because um, you know the the whole theme of of the Nicomachean ethics is eudaimonia, you know, the 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 highest human good is happiness, and and so so the questions of choice and so forth are embedded in our human situation what is good make, what what makes us um happy and healthy and belong to each other in noble ways and so forth virtuous ways um so that's an easier one for me to see that connection between interpretation and ethics as a hermeneutic we could even call it a hermeneutic virtue right the 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 trickier thing that I'm more resistant to I don't know if any of you have read a dotori has a, written an excellent essay in which he makes the strong claim, he thinks that Gadamer's hermeneutics is practical reason in the Aristotelian sense. A very strong uh, claim is the basis of that article. Um, and that always worries me because um, uh, then where is poetics? Um, and, you know, Gadamer is very clear, like in the F Reflections article that John mentioned, he says he started with art, and art is really why he got into the humanities. Um, and so in an Aristotelian framework, I worry about identifying everything with practical philosophy, um, because then what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the poetics? Okay, that's a big question. <laughs> were there two? You said, was that the, you said there were two things? Was that both of them? Well, so I, 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 I find it easy to, to connect interpretation uh, and ethics because interpretation is all the way down so yeah. it connects very nicely to you i you dynamonia and in an aristotelian framework i find it more difficult to identify to identify practical philosophy or practical reason or practical wisdom with hermeneutics yeah got it Yeah, Don Marshall, and then then we're going to try to get some more people in here. Sure. Well, just uh, I, I don't want to I, I just want to say that practical philosophy is a sort of umbrella term for several activities. And those activities are distinguishable in an Aristotelian way, politics, ethics, for Gadamer, rhetoric, for Gadamer, hermeneutics and poetics. They're distinguishable, though they're very closely interrelated, and so they constantly overlap and refer to each other. So that, that's fine. I, I and you know you could call them all practical philosophy. Their phronesis is involved in all. Uh, you could do all of that. That's fine. As to poetics, Aristotle says that that a tragedy, a poem, is more philosophical <laughs> than history. <laughs> famously said. What I think that means is. A, 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 a tragedy, for instance, is the kind of thing that is more likely to replay reflection, thinking about it, than mere matter of fact. I think that's what he means, okay? And that reflection is a reflection on the coherence of human life, even in circumstances where it seems to be, to have no moral basis. So in a tragedy, it turns out that a, a, a basically good person ends up badly, but he ends up badly, not through chance, not just through disaster, but through an error he makes. And thus we can understand the coherence of that life. And that's a very important thing to understand in relation to our ethical life, in relation to our political life, because it's about prominent people who are important in the polis. That's what a tragedy is about. So I think poetics is connected with these other, uh, these other fields of practical philosophy or these other areas, these local areas of practical philosophy. Okay, uh, just that.
I keep forgetting to unmute. There we go. John Arthos, I'm not sure if that, I don't know if that, that satisfied you. Oh, yeah, you've even posted in the chat there, but but it's a start of an answer. Niall, you want to get in here too? Yeah, I could. Um, um, I think this has been a helpful conversation because I think the other thing that would be if, if hermeneutics is practical wisdom, which I think he wants to say, uh, her, if, if hermeneutics has a method, hermeneutics, the method of hermeneutics is fundamentally connected to practical wisdom. But a good distinction then would be to distinguish practical wisdom from technique, right? So the techne. So, uh, so most of us, when you're filling in funding applications or something like that, and the method section comes up, that nightmarish method section, and you say hermeneutical method, then we shouldn't make it sound like a mere technique that you would apply to a specific um, zone, right? And I think, so what could the, it, it really, I don't know, we're forced to kind of think about method in a broader sense. And the scope, I guess, I think if you remember one of the readings, I don't know which reading it was, maybe it was the one that the, the lectures Gadamer gave in South Africa, but scope was being mentioned all the time, scopos. So what is the goal of this particular method? And, and I just wanted to come back to one of the points that I, I made earlier is that the, the, for Aristotle, uh, when you think about praxis, you think about that which can be otherwise. So th this idea, what, what is contingent and subject to change, so subject to vision and further revision is always this scope of practical wisdom. So it's not a method. It's not a, it's not a method if by method you mean a technique of understanding. And I think that would be important. I, I really don't know how to respond to the, 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 the poesis question or the, 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 what happens to the poetics um, uh, really, but I think distinguishing practical wisdom from technique, uh, and also to say uh, for Aristotle, the practical wisdom, the end of practical wisdom is good action, right? Right, where the end of technique has an object which is outside the technique, like the barrel that is made by barrel making. So if you have a technique of barrel making, you have good barrels at the end. And I think that that distinction between practical wisdom it has its own end in itself. Might be might be a uh, one good way to 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 cash that out. Yeah, thanks. Great, thanks, now. Uh, John Beach. John, you might be muted still. Uh, this this go. is all helpful, but I'd like to challenge that because, I mean. Practical philosophy then is certainly a science that is a knowledge of the universal that as such is teachable. And I'd like to say that Gadamer, I think somewhere he says that, you, you know, we're taking like, you know, the model of the craftsman that we think the telos is the barrel or whatever is it meant. But Gadamer would say, no, we still have to ask what is its purpose within the polis? What good will it serve? This is what the uh, guys at Facebook forgot to ask uh, when they were creating it. Like, what? How is this going to serve humanity and be the good? Like, this is this is the telos goes this far, and so it's not just uh, the product or the object. I don't think. Um, so I, I, I no, I, good points, good questions, but uh, but I just I'm not convinced. Yeah. That's why I'm not so sure what you're not talks. convinced about. Um, well, because well, I was making I, this distinction between practical wisdom and techne. So I agree with what you say about. Are you yeah, saying and, that practical wisdom could be understood as a techne? Um, no, no. Um, but that that um, the uh, if there if we're looking at the end, if we're looking at the telos in practical wisdom, it's 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 much broader than the than the four causes from the from the the techne uh analogy that aristotle uses i think that's what i was maybe maybe you weren't saying that no i was saying that the end of practical wisdom is in the practical wisdom itself it is its own fulfillment in good action right it doesn't have its end outside itself in a product oh like okay not in a product but in the good it has yeah, to be yeah. in the good Absolutely. It has to be in the good in the total context. That's why I think he calls it 
uh, political philosophy, because ultimately, like, how does it serve the polis and the good of man, and uh, or the good of the unity? So, yeah. It, it, by the way, the very first sentence in the Mino is like Mino asks all these questions, like, what is it? Uh, also, be worth referring to as well. I'm sorry. I'm you're muted, John. John, you're muted. Uh, John, you, John, <laughs> you're muted sorry. again. Sorry about that. Go, sorry. go ahead. Yeah, Gautamer says like. Sometimes we talk about the uh, better being the enemy of the good, or the and and Gautamer says, well, we can't really judge what is the better unless we take the good, the striving for the good, into account. And so there's always the striving for the good um, in in all practical knowledge. So that's why it has that theoretical dimension. That's why I think it's a it's a continuum and. And he, he tries to avoid, like, he, when he talks about practical philosophy, it's certainly not what we, we mean by practical philosophy, because we're still, we haven't made the, the, the Karen mentioned the, the, the departure that Nietzsche made and that Heidegger made. We're still back in the Enlightenment. We're still thinking um, about hermeneutics and interpretation. It hasn't caught up to us yet. Yeah, okay. Great, John. Thank Thanks. You. Okay. So, I mean, this text is rich with quotes, you know, sort of, if you were to put together some greatest hits of God over, I think some of them come. I was wondering if there were things, uh, quotes that really struck people. Either it's like, wow, I could get that tattooed. That'd be great. Or, you know, or something that you just thought that you really reacted strongly against and thought, wait a minute. I don't know about that. So I'm wondering, especially maybe people who haven't gotten in here yet, are there things about the reading that really struck you? That whether we've talked about it or not yet, I'd be curious what sort of th what things jumped out at you one way or the other. David. Yes, Nancy. I really like the quote that's in the very last paragraph. Okay. About, um, and yet the universal desire to know does not break off at the point where concrete practical discernment is a decisive issue. There, there's something about that that um, I find that when I assign this reading to, to my class, my hermeneutic class, that um, that people in the practice professions, and so people who would enroll in my class would be from nursing, education, social work, or psychology. And um, that they're always drawn, that something about this particular paper really um, resonates with them. And I think it's because we are in practice professions. And you know that that's been a line that's been pointed out to me several times by people who have read it, who said that something is sort of had grabbed for them. Yeah, no, that's that's a, that's a, those two sentences together. I gotta say, my paradigm example for this, I think you appreciate this, is the phrase "do no harm," mm. which is one of the sort of the the core medical ethical principles. But I feel like. It's almost empty unless you know what exactly that means in practice. What exactly counts as harm and not harm and in this situation? What is you? So I, I read this, and I think being told do no harm, I feel like doesn't do a lot for you unless you really have an understanding of these practical lived yeah. understanding of these situations. And that's but kind the, of back to Niall's point too, David, yeah. about um, the fulfillment of the good. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, right. sort of 
it's a little bit of a flip from do no harm, but. Right. No, it's very similar. But then also the, the lived understanding, the practical understanding, the concrete practical discernment, even when you realize how decisive that is, it doesn't, it does, it, right? It doesn't mean you're no longer interested in stepping back and reading yeah. Gadamer and trying to think through these things or, and trying to figure and that's where out. I think, and sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, yeah. And just one quick question. I don't even have my hand up, but, um, but I think that that really takes us to Gadamer's work on tact and um, the way that, that yeah. tact doesn't necessarily mean not seeing something, but it means to sidestep it and to um, deliberately uh, and intentionally look around it. Hmm. Um, at times of discernment that that's what what you need to do so right nice nice Niall yeah I wanted to uh since you were talking about you know takeaways or quotes uh from this text it's per, it's perhaps a little bit of a bugbear for me but I think Gadamer sometimes falls into the trap that Heidegger between the good and bad words a little bit right there's the bad words that will take us in a certain direction and there's the good words but this, so page 243, end of the, end of the page, right? Because, so this text has been very much against a psychologistic understanding of understanding and interpretation, et cetera. So the text starts with in this most authentic realm. Does everyone see that? So, so 243, I believe, yeah. Uh, in this most authentic realm, if I can read it, um, of hermeneutic experience, the conditions of which a hermeneutic philosophy tries to give an account, the affinity of hermeneutics with practical philosophy is confirmed. First of all, understanding like action always involves a risk and is never just a simple application of a general, uh, general knowledge of rules to the statements or text to be understood. So I like it so far. And then he says, furthermore, where it is successful, understanding means a growth of inner awareness as a new experience enters into the texture of our own mental experience. Now, he seems to be endorsing a kind of quasi mentalistic picture there of inner. So, you know, this discussion between Erlebnis and Erfahrung that, that he's always kind of having, where the problem with Erlebnis for him is the inner experience. And now he's talking about inner awareness. So he's back to the inner uh, and he's back to the mental. And he seems to be using it in very positive terms. Um, so I, I just sometimes wondering what's, is there good mental and bad mental? Is there good inner and bad inner? Because during the conference, we had this whole discussion about whether Gadamer is advocating a, a hermeneutics of the inner and the outer at all, or is it always the interplay between the two? But here he seems to emphasize the very thing he criticizes Diltai for falling into is this kind of erlebnis, inner awareness, inner effects, inner experiences. Um, uh, is that David, wrong? Do you think, or D David? David, you're probably a good person to answer that question. I did want to point out that I think that's an excellent point, right? I mean, he, he, there are these moments. So polemically, he really wants to insist as a countercorrection to subjectivism. He doesn't like, you know, Cartesian, the the theater of the mind, and all that. So that's a big polemical project for him. So he's pushing that at any time he can. And yet, as you point out, there are these moments when, but I think that that's, in a way he's a humanist, right? He's, um, that he's comfortable talking about the person as opposed to the subject. And, it, you know, he, he, he actually, in criticizing at Leibniz, he actually it almost gives it some credit. So I think it's a really interesting question. But so David, I probably, you, you know uh, something about this. No, I was just consulting the, the German and hoping that we could save him here, <laughs> the translation. I, you know, I just read right past and thought he was talking about self-understanding again, because we don't want to conflate self-understanding with inner awareness, yeah. right? So I'm still looking through the German. <laughs> on this one. I, I, I guess what I want to say is, I do not want to put, you know, what he's describing there out of bounds for hermeneutics for Gadamer. I think yeah. he trades in that pretty easily. He 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 disobeys his own um, polemic, with, and I think that that's okay. I guess is what I want to say. Hmm. 
an inner burden. Um, I thought I would just mention, it's not quite on your point, but it is, but the quote that you read takes us right up to the quote that Catherine put in the chat. All right, those are, are right together. Uh, Catherine, did you want to say something about, about it or just leave it leave it there for us to read and think about? Uh, I'll just say something briefly, I, I guess. Um, yeah, I think that quote stood out to me. Um, that was, I think, in hermeneutics in general, something that drew me to it as an approach for my research was um, what Nancy writes in one of her books was the ability to kind of write provocatively about something that what you've been talking about moving towards a good. So the ability to write in a way that you might be able to change perceptions, not only broaden your own understanding or challenge your own preconceptions, but to challenge that of others and hopefully achieve some good out of what you're looking out of what you're looking into. So I really enjoyed that quote. Yeah, great, great. Thanks. Uh, Don Marshall. I just uh, well, it's uh, it's I thought that was very good. Understanding is uh, dangerous. This uh, we're, we're we're being led to I think a really important passage here. Uh, I do think he doesn't want to think of it as subjective in the sense of Cartesian subjectivity, in the sense of Fichtean self understanding. Uh, that's that's not where he wants to go. He says there's a new concept of self understanding here, and the new concept of un self understanding is one that accepts finitude. Okay. And I think he, uh, there, there are passages I found in sort of doing this, where in looking at his essays on practical philosophy, he actually critiques Heidegger directly in a way that he does not usually do. He's usually very tactful, even guarded when he refers to Heidegger. But one of the places where he explicitly criticizes Heidegger is the concept of Mitzsein. And he says that Mitzsein is not adequate to sociality. It's not adequate to the presence of the other. And he even says that Heidegger himself recognized that what Gadamer meant by the other went beyond Mitzsein. He accuses Heidegger of being focused too much on the individual. And Gadamer is through and through social. So if I understand anything, I understand it socially in solidarity with other people. Solidarity is one of his very important words, okay? So even at the end of this, nevertheless, uh, we are <laughs> implicated in this. And so at the end of this very paragraph, he says, everything that understanding mediates is mediated through ourselves. That is, uh, I can't escape my implication and my responsibility for what I think. <laughs> Uh, I can't. I can't give an alibi. I can't uh, objectify it. It's me, and for better or worse, it's me. You know, uh, and so I have to be self-aware. Okay, uh, but I. I just want to kind of emphasize that sociality uh, very much. Okay. You know, uh, that's exactly right. I. I agree with that a thousand percent. That's what he's saying again and again and again. And that's how he criticizes Heidegger and all that's correct. But I just think that there's a way in which sort of in a very common sense human way, he would use a phrase like uh, inner, inner awareness, um, my own mental experience, our own mental experience. He's just not going to deny the fact that, that uh, you know, there is a portion of our being that is individual, that we have inner experiences, he's not saying that those things don't exist. And so they enter into his conversation quite naturally, despite the fact that he's really, uh, really trying to take us to our under to the to the to the fundamental sociality of our being. Yeah, Carolyn. Yeah, I just, what what Don said there uh, had made sense to me because there is this discussion here of, of, of Fichte and how the um, way that hermeneutic interpretation proceeds would be, would be different from um, this kind of constructivist project of someone like Fico or Fichte or Kant, um, where at the end we would come back to the individual you know, consciousness being certain of its own activity. And I, 
it strikes me that one of the things that Godmer wants is, you know, yes, there is this return to thinking about the constitutive role of um, presuppositions and such, but to echo Don's point, those presuppositions end up being not only social, but um, already situate me within this kind of hermeneutic encounter where to, to understand them, I have to ask questions, right? I guess I wanted to kind of just bring this back to the, the, the passage on the question too. Like the social, in some ways as, you know, accounts of like socially situated understanding, which just say, oh, it goes back to like a social form of life. But it's interesting here that when Gadamer kind of circles back and says, you know, what do we find in the hermeneutic situation? There's still this, um, this indeterminacy, this question. Oh, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> go ahead, Andrew. He's gone. I have a page open in one of my favorite books by Walter Lamy, and I've been looking at it uh, here and there. And uh, so that's my uh, my authority, <laughs> my logical fallacy, if you'll do have the authority. But, you know, it occurs to me that the social might not be so distinct from the animal or the natural. And to what extent does Gatter envision the ideal human life on the model of bees, insects, and plants and animals, and that our elevation of consciousness and our theoretical perspective really is, our theoretical perspective in some contexts um, might be um, what animals have by instinct or a sense of time that they have by instinct. But I guess I just, the main point I wanted to make is drawing up the social uh, into his model and idealization, you might say, of um, bee and insect communities. Yeah, great. In other words, nature. Nature. Yeah, thanks. Um, I put the German up here. Now, I'm not sure it, it's so bad in German. I think it's closer to just we, if, if um, furthermore, when when understanding happens, it uh, we become aware that uh, a new experience has entered into, has uh, entered into our spiritual, our Geistigen experiences, something like this. It, I don't ha see it as as strongly of inner inner experience the way that it gets translated. But, well, we've got about three minutes left. Are there are there final thoughts about about the text about practical hermeneutics as practical philosophy? I'm not seeing hands come flying up <laughs> at this point. But, uh... oh, wait, there was one. Yes, Nancy. Nancy, you're muted. Well, there we go. You know, I just laugh at other people when they do it. But... <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, tomorrow uh, call for papers is coming out for Canadian Hermeneutic Institute. And we have uh, Professor Bessie as our visiting scholar and the agenda's up, it's posted on our website. And um, at this point, we're planning to hold it in person next June, um, but we're making the final decision about that in January. And so um, we can let people know then. So you can't register till then until we actually know. So anyway, so please submit papers if you're interested. Yeah, I agree. I feel like I can't announce that without sounding self-promotional, but you can do it, Nancy. Thank you. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, it's no, all, it's a it's really, all... really good um, agenda that David has for us. And uh, I think it, I think it'd be really interesting. So do you want to put the link in the in the chat? Sure. Yeah. You see OK. And John Arthos. Yeah, as long as we're doing uh, uh, announcements, I also wanted to invite folks, um, and I'll put it up in the chat, uh, it, next month, uh, November 7th, I believe, on a Saturday, the Hermeneutics in Real Life project that we're running. So I'll put this up because I'm speaking then, and you're all welcome um, to that uh, Hermeneutics and Rhetoric in General Education. 
Um, so please, uh, please come to that if you're interested. That's great, John. Thanks. Thanks, Nancy. So somewhere I have the list of, I'm trying to find it, the list of texts that we were, were thinking about doing next. Um, I'll track that down. If you have requests, send them to me. Um, we haven't done anything yet on poetics or aesthetics among, I mean, there's no shortage of things to read and discuss, right? So uh, if you um, if you have requests, send them to me and I'll put some together and send it out to everybody. And you can let me know what you would like to do. And next time we would meet would be mid-December. Let's see what, what exactly it looks like. December. It looks like it'd be about December 19th. December 12th or December 19th. Somewhere in there. Um, so I think that's it. I want to thank everybody for coming and thank you for the discussion. It's been really great. I, I look forward to these uh, all the time. I really enjoy them. So thanks for all your comments. And I will contact everybody with thoughts about where, first of all, where this is posted on YouTube so you can share it with all your friends and everyone can relive the experience. <laughs> and then also um, with thoughts about the next reading so you can, you can have a, a say in what we discuss next. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.